Hi, and welcome back to Continual. I'm going to be your host this evening, Jim Nettles, and tonight we're going to be talking about banned books, a little bit of a history of banned books, what some of our favorite ones are, why do we see people and organizations go to push to banned books, and what do we think that that really means where we are as a culture. But before we really dive into the fun, let's go around the room and see who else is here. So Dawn. Hi, my name is Dawn Deal. Um, I am a retired teacher, so I taught English. This is in my wheelhouse, so to speak, and I am currently an author of Romance and Erotic Romance. Samantha? I am currently a middle school Spanish teacher, um, and I see plenty of attempts to keep my children from reading things that's going to corrupt their little minds, which shows that people don't know these kids very well at all. And um, I write the Menopausal Superhero series and read fan books all the time because I don't like being told what to read. John? Hi, my name is John L. French. I am a retired crime scene investigator for the Baltimore City Police Department. Now I'm a full-time writer and editor, um, and um, I've read a lot of banned books, mostly before they were banned, and um, enjoyed some of them. And Alan. Hi, I'm Alan Roach. I'm a professor of English at University of North Carolina at Charlotte. I uh, teach the graphic novel, and so incorporated in that are many books that have been banned recently and not so recently. Um, and I look at the uh, history of the production of knowledge, so that in many ways I've contemplated lots and lots of historical cases of banned books or uh, resistant readers. So looking and talking about banned books, I mean, to help define it for the audience, we really are looking at books that some bo governmental body or political body has looked and said, we don't want our constituency to see or read this. I mean, today, a lot of this falls into our school systems where people go and say, I don't want my kids necessarily to see or read this. And generally, uh, like right now with kind of the, the well-publicized uh, attack on mouse, you know, we see things where these are books that challenge people's way of thinking. They challenge the, you know, what the societal norms or what people are comfortable with at the time, especially when we're talking about stuff with uh, things that ha kids have easy access to things along these lines. So to kind of set the, the level, let's go around and talk a little bit about how do you guys feel about uh the act of actually banning a book or when organizations make these kinds of determinations. Uh, so Dawn, I'm going to throw this to you as the, the retired teacher. Um, actually, it's funny because one of my first um, memories of, of a banning a book actually is the Mike Royko article, ban my book, please. Um, and I, I must've been 11 or 12. And, and I think that was actually my first sort of, uh, interaction with this idea that somebody would try to ban a book. It was just really foreign to me um, because I came from a household where books just were, and you could, you know, I, I read anything you put in front of me. Um, so why, why are, why are books banned? Um, I, I think it's a foolhardy attempt to kill an idea. Um, and it really just feeds into what they call the Streisand effect. You know, if, if it's banned, there has to be a reason. And it really just drives up, up sales. Um, I think it's misguided and, and nearly impossible. And actually, the fact that books were banned usually got my kids to read them more than, than anything else I, I could have done. Been saying, you know, there are places where you couldn't read this book. And they just really, um, really loved it. How about you, Samantha? Yeah, similarly, I think it's it's about control. It's, you know, about trying to impose your set of values on a wider group. And um, when I see it in the schools, a lot of time it's a couple of parents who want to make decisions for all parents. And so you're not happy parenting just their own kid. They want to tell the rest of us how to do it, too. And, um, you know, obviously I'm against it. <laughs> John? I think initially, you know, back in um, back in the era when Alan Alan had mentioned before we started, you know, the you know the medieval times and all that, Henry VIII and all that, even even Thomas More, um, if there was a book 
that you believe that uh, a particular religion believed was um, heretical, then to wipe out the heresy, you destroyed the books. And it wasn't like they had, you know, ye old bookstore where they could walk down and get another copy. You know, you destroyed enough of books, you actually destroyed the book. And um, I think the whatever religion, both the Catholics and the Protestants did this, um, they felt it was a means of essentially self-defense. If we don't wipe out the idea, we, our ideas could be. Now it's, I think a lot of books are banned out of fear. Fear that, you know, the people, the fear that people will read a particular book and learn something you don't want them to learn. And thus might absolutely change your, change their mind from what you've taught them to something that they figure out themselves. How about you, Alan? I'll buy into that. And I'll, you know, I'll also say that, you know, um, <clears throat> uh, what we're trying to do when we ban books, uh, and I'm not including myself amongst that group, but, you know, is to restrict availability of knowledge. And it's knowledge that somebody has identified as either um, incorrect, politi politically incorrect, or uh, oppositional to state or religious values. And, uh, you know, talking about the Bible made me think about when I was uh, in, in school, uh, and, and this was Hebrew school, and I we read passages from the Bible. Of course, there were some very salacious passages. Um, we read in Hebrew, and our Hebrew was very good. But um, all of a sudden, we'd skip chapters four, five, and six, um, partly because there was something sexual going on there. And that's when my fellow students and I became the best scholars possible. I mean, we poured over those pages to learn what we were missing or what they were hiding from us. And of course, um, that's, uh, that's part and parcel. I mean, whether it's at a kind of micro level or a macro level, for example, um, one of the ways of banning or restricting books was to resist translation. And uh, since um, uh, John mentioned the Bible earlier, like different religious groups, uh, you know, until the Bible was translated or published widely, uh, you know, people couldn't read it. And so they had to trust what their preacher or priest had to say about the Bible, but it was in Latin and it wasn't accessible to you and it wasn't available because it wasn't the old bookstore. And that was a form of restriction. And once we had things like the printing press to say nothing of social media or the web, which we have now, um, uh, it's a fool's errand to, in some sense, censor books. Yeah, and and I tend to agree because when I look at the idea of what, how we now regard banned books, which is pretty much somebody's school system or somebody comes in and says, I don't want my kids reading that. Mm -hmm. You know, fortunately, we don't currently have, at least in the U.S., a situation where the government itself is coming and saying, you just can't read that material at all. And I think that we do see a degree of self-censorship self going on as well uh, by a lot of different groups or, or in things along those lines. So when we look at this idea of a banned book, you know, what's the first one that you picked up, held in your hand and read and you know, may or may not have even understood why it was quote unquote, a banned book within that culture or you know, within your culture, the school system whatever the case may be. So Samantha, how about you? So there may be some that I read when I was younger that I didn't know were banned, you know, cause I, I read them like, cause they were on the bookshelf at my house. Like Dawn, my house was mm -hmm. full of books and my mother would let me read whatever I could read and would sit down and discuss it with me. But I know when I got to school, you know, there was always like, Oh, they can't have this in the school library. And so I can remember in a fifth or sixth grade, Lady Chatterley's Lover was going around with a you know copy with all the right pages dog-eared down so you know where to read the smut. 
So that's that that was much more effective than the school sex education program. <laughs> um, and then uh, maybe it was middle school. Um, VC Andrews, um, those flowers in the attic. Oh, series. yeah. Yeah. Those were ones that parents were all up in arms about. So, of course, all of us wanted to read them. And all it took was, you know, one person made it out to be Dalton without their mom there and bought a copy. And then the whole school got it eventually. So it was a great tactic for getting us to read. <laughs> How about you, John? Uh, um, when I was growing up, the concept of banned books were, was basically um, stuff the Nazis didn't want uh, you know, want, want you to read it actually still is. But um, I remember reading uh, A Brave New World, The Catcher in the Rye, 1984, Huckleberry Finn, all these books that now some group or the other want being. And, you know, I didn't think anything of it. I mean, I formed my own opinion as to whether or not I'd ever reread these books and whether they were good or not but um you know these these are the first i mean other, you know these are the first so-called banned books that i've read there was other than what my you know mother i'd take bring home from the library my mother would look at something and say you're too young to read this and take it back you know but um you know it's you know i didn't grow up with the concept of i'm not allowed to read this book or that Oh, except my mother, for some reason, did not want me to read Superman comics if it had Bizarro in it. Something about <laughs> Bizarro really freaked my mother out, and I wasn't allowed to read it, which means I tried to sneak it in when I went to the dentist. But, um, you know, that that was it. You know, the, on the only banned reading material I knew about was the Bizarro comics. How about you, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about this because um, <laughs> you two have the Bizarro band in your house. No, no. Although <laughs> my father, my father was very concerned about me reading comic books, uh, but not, you know, I mean, he sort of falsely banned them in, in the sense that he, you know, he tried to shame me a little bit, but not, you know, not in any kind of serious way. But I was thinking uh, this, like this, you're eliciting a, a true confession. I don't think I've ever divulged. You know, there were these books that uh, circulated when uh, amongst when I was a camp a camper, uh, like uh, this Victorian uh, Victorian pornography diary of a young maid or something that kind of that kind of thing, um, or uh, a book you know long forgotten called the Harrod Experiment. Um, Didn't read it. Saw the movie. <laughs> they made a movie out of it. <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> I missed it. Um, in any event, you know, uh, that, you know, that nobody knew, I mean, except for my, my circle of friends, nobody, I mean, I, I say that nobody knew we read, but I'm sure everybody was looking, every parent was looking under our, our, uh, our beds or in between the mattress and finding these things. Um, but uh, we knew that that was, um, especially the Victorian one that was a banned book. Now, you know, I teach Victorian lit now. So uh I, I haven't brought it into the classroom, and I doubt that I will. Not that I'm banning it, but, you know, um, it's, uh, it, the, I mean, the Harrod experiment was a lot worse as literature than um, I thought it was. In fact, uh, uh, there was a, I, there was a, I was so eager, and now I think I make myself sound like some kind of terrible kid. Uh, my parents had a copy of the book, the biography of Auguste Rodin. And uh, if you remember, the, uh, the title of the book was called Naked Came I, and which I read as Naked Came One. And um, <laughs> I read that assiduously. It's like, you know, I worked very hard. There was like nothing in it. You know, it was just like all biographical stuff about this French sculptor, which at eight years old or nine years old was really tedious. Um, so I was hunting down bad books, even though I couldn't find them. <laughs> How about you, Don? Um, well, yeah, I did. I didn't read the Victoria. I, actually, I was thinking of Fanny Hill. I, I just uh, actually read yeah, Fanny yeah. Hill. Well, that's an intense one. Um, the first banned book that I, I was aware of, it was controversial. 
um, was Forever by Judy Bloom. Oh, yes. I, I mean, I just happened to be of an age that when it came out, it, it, you know, it was another book that we sort of passed around, but I had a copy of it. You know, I don't know whether my mom didn't know what it was about because it was by Judy Bloom and she liked Judy Bloom. Um, but yeah, that it, one wasn't really quite super fudge, was it? <laughs> no, it wasn't. But, <laughs> but even Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, you know, which, um, you know, it, it's really tame by a, a lot of standards. It was and still is, you know, brought up as a book that people shouldn't be reading. But so Forever was um, the very first book that I was aware of. It was banned and made sure as many people um, that I could pass it on to, you know, that dog-eared copy when it went around through my friends. So when we look at this idea of, of banned books and banned works and everything else, do you often think that we see because to me, it's much more a reflection of the group that wants to ban them than the work itself. I mean, it, that's really what we're always seeing here is whether it's a religious institution, whether it is a school board, whether it is a political body of some other sort coming and saying, this material is not, not, uh, is not suitable for our audience of X. And when we look at that and, and go through this idea of you know, I think we've all highlighted the fact that the idea of going and saying this is something that is controversial or just not suitable drives people to go to one, pick it up, drives people to want to go grab it. And, you know, much like I started with Mouse, we've seen this, the sales of that book soar. Are there any books that, you know, beyond some of the ones we just talked about that maybe you've looked and said, I hadn't, I'd never heard of it before. But because of the controversy, I've got to go pick it up. I've got to ha- you know, hold it in my hands, go read it, see what, see what the whole thing is all about to try to make a determination for myself. So, John, how about you? Is there anything that you, know, it, you just heard and said, I've got to go find this out? Uh, not recently. Um, I tend to make my own decisions about what I, want, what I will read and what I don't want to read. Um, the one book I can remember reading it because... People weren't supposed to read it because it was a dirty book. Was when I was in high school, I went to the library and I knew I couldn't bring it home, so I read it at the library. Was Nabokov's Lolita because this was supposed to be? I mean, I'd heard you know on the you know I'd heard something about how they made a movie about it and. You know how it was on. I think the movie was on the Legion of Decency. It was categorized as C for condemned and the Legion of Decency. Um, but I read it and darn if I could find any. I mean, he described what happened, but he did it. So, you know, you know, but no, I mean, I've now I had a teacher um, who would um who would bring in books and explain to them, you know, that, you know, you know, we're not going to be using the recommended reading. We're going to be reading these books. Please don't let the nuns find out. And, you know, of course, you know, we read that. The most daring thing he ever did was bring in J.P. Dunleavy's uh, Ginger Man. That was if the nuns find out, you're back to your prime, you're back to the recommended reading and I'm out of here. So, of course, we all read it. And it was literature, stream of consciousness. And, yeah, there was a couple dirty parts, but it was written in such a way as you had really had to work to figure out what was going on. And there was still one of the funniest things I've ever read in literature is when Sebastian Dangerfield got on the subway car, the book subway car, and well, the underground in London, and couldn't figure out why everybody was staring at him. I won't give it away because... uh, it's a major spoiler. Now everybody has to go out and ginger man. How about you, Alan? Well, I was just thinking about, uh, you just brought up, um, I remember reading uh, Philip Roth's Portnoy's Complaint. Um, and uh, that was, there, there was a, um, you know, by this time, I mean, because so many books have been in, published, uh in, you know, describing various kinds of activities that take place, including masturbation. 
Um, but the interesting thing, I think, of Portnoy's complaint, and just speaking to the question you're asking originally, and that is, uh, there's a constituency, and paradoxically, the constituency was a constituency of, of Jewish readers who felt that the Jewish community shouldn't be represented by so awful a, a character uh, as there was in Portnoy's complaint. And the same thing was true even, uh, this is a Canadian novel, uh, Mordecai Ritzler's The Apprenticeship of Duddy Kravitz. Uh, so, you know, those are uh, books that I, I kind of went to. Um, Lolita, uh, more recently, I think, when I don't know that I had read Alison Bechtel's Fun House until I started reading the controversy about it. And then it was banned uh, in a number of um, uh, schools in South Carolina. And I thought, well, this is a book that, you know, this is a book that I must read. And... Um, you know, ultimately, I felt it was a book that I must teach. And fortunately, uh, so far, it's not been banned, you know, in North Carolina, at least any place that I know of, and not in the county. But it's, you know, a really, really powerful, um, revealing book. And, uh, you know, there's so much insight um, that readers get from it. I mean, you know, students find it incredibly rewarding. And, and those who are I don't know that they're offended by it, but they just don't know what to make of it. And I think, and I'll, I think that one of the issues we're always dealing with is the ignorance of people who are banning books, either about the text themselves or about the people who have written it or about the subject material, whether it's lesbians or, or Jews or uh, the Holocaust, um, uh, the, in in the uh, since we haven't touched on Mouse, but I'll just say this: you know, I read the uh, transcripts from the McMinn, Tennessee um, sort of inquest or whatever you want to call it in the books. And uh, you know, one of the teachers says, "Oh, I love teaching about the Holocaust." <laughs> like you know, yeah. I mean, um, uh, it, it, that's got to be at least as offensive to somebody sitting in the classroom. You know, saying, well, hang on, you love teaching this stuff where like hundreds of my relatives died. So uh, there's this really this kind of gem like flame of ignorance to quote Walter Pater. How about you, Don? Um, yeah, actually, it's funny because I went to see you know, what were the most recently challenged books. And I was surprised that about half of that list were books that are sort of long-standing, you know, banned books. Um, but there were there are quite a few new ones on there, and I actually have two that I'm going to go out and buy. And both are actually children's books. Um, very one book, uh, "A Day in the Life of Marlon Bundo," which is a picture book that um, is I've seen on several lists, and "Prince and Knight." Um, are those two books I'm actually going to go to the bookstore in the next couple of days and make sure I have a copy because um, someday I want to have grandchildren and you know have these kind of books uh, available to them because they both look absolutely fantastic so I have a new reading list it won't take me long but yeah how about you Samantha so I think when when I was an undergrad I probably sought out books that I thought were um, that maybe my mother or my grandmother would have thought were shocking, you know. So I was looking for books with lots of sex, lots of smut. You know, I was reading um, The Book of O and like, um, I think I revisited Lady Chatterley then because then I was old enough to actually understand the whole book. Um, Tropic of Cancer, um, Lolita, all of that kind of stuff. Um, eventually I grew up enough that I was less shocked by such things and, you know, what fun was it if I wasn't shocked? <laughs> But um, here lately, I think mostly when a book being banned drives me towards it, it's more connected to my teaching life. When people are trying to stop the kids from reading something, then I want to go see what it's about. And so, like, I, I also I looked at the ALA list of most challenged books, and there's a couple on there that are books I read because they had been challenged in other schools. And I wanted to be prepared to speak to it should it come up in my school. So, like, uh, there's Speak by uh, Laurie House Anderson. That's a young adult novel that gets challenged a lot because it dares to say 
that um, a woman who's been raped can talk about that. Um, and uh, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexie um, is uh, another one that I read because it had been challenged. Um, and uh, Angie Thomas, The Hate You Give. So those are three I read recently because they've been challenged in other schools and I wanted to be able to really speak to what it was because I'd read it. Because so often I find when, when these things come up, especially in schools, it looks like the people didn't read it. You know, they didn't bother to read it before they decided no one else should read it. And um, the, the reasons they give are just lies or, you know, like they, they, say, they say they're banning it for this reason, so they don't have to say they're banning it for the real reason. Like in the case with Mouse, I seem to remember that part of it was they were trying to say that it was inappropriate because there was one panel that had nudity in it, like in this whole graphic novel. And we're talking cartoon mouse people. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. it's, it's not very realistic nudity right. as far as human, human nudity. And, um, and maybe a curse word. And, and those were, they were giving as like the official reasons. And I'm like, no, it's that you would like to deny that the Holocaust happened. At least have the cojones to admit what your real problem is. Well, they, they say that there were nine curse words in it. I think nine. Um, and I won't go through them because I, I don't necessarily <laughs> want to. But, you know, they're, they're, they're not curse words that uh, I haven't heard come from uh, lots of uh, eight-year-old, 10-year-old, nine-year-olds or worse. And then the nudity is actually of a, a human being, but it's uh, Art Spiegelman's uh, mother who has, uh, sorry, spoiler alert for those people who haven't looked, who has committed suicide and is in a bathtub. And, you know, you really can't see anything except that she has, um, she's, she's killed herself. Um, and so they're uh, not upset that there's a dead woman in the book. They're oh, upset exactly, that she's naked. Exactly. Yeah, and, right. <laughs> And really, speaking of exposure, you know, uh, young children's exposure to things you probably don't want them to see, I think I'd rather them see a, you know, a naked woman than a dead woman. Well, well yeah, because, yeah, you know, I don't know what rothers. I don't, you know, I'd, I'd uh, you know, in some sense, if the narrative calls for one or the other. Um, whether it's an illustration or whether it's textual, then, um, you know, it, it's again, it's not up us to up. It's not us to up. It's not up to us to either speak uh -huh. properly or <laughs> it's not up to us to really make the decision. Um, if, if it's compelling in the narrative, it's not compelling in the narrative. Then, uh, you know, the book is, is not going to succeed, but not because of banning, but just because of incompetence. Right. Well, and I think one of the things, I mean, as an author, I know I've heard repeatedly in some work, somebody going and saying, you know, well, what's the kind of content in the book? You know, and if you go and say, oh, yeah, I kill a whole lot of people, but there's no on, on screen sex. Oh, yeah. You know, my 10 year old can have it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. Um, it is shocking how um, when, well, when you look at curriculums in schools, um, when I was an English teacher, I, I used we always used to talk about the curriculum of death that like everything that was considered okay that we would teach in a high school English class was bleak. And it's like, can we yeah. not read a comedy? And like, no, because if there's a comedy, there's probably going to be sex. You know, and that's so much worse than death, apparently. My, my daughter went to, uh, you know, well, she went to a Catholic high school. In fact, it was called the Catholic High School of Baltimore. And um, she pointed out that a lot of the books that she had to read for school ended up with people dying and um you know it was you know i forget well i know um one of the books i think everybody had to read when i was in high school was death be not proud you know but um she read a lot of books where the whole thing either somebody got you know it was basically somebody dies and everybody reacts to it you know and so um you know could we please read something where people don't die yeah, like all the Shakespeare we teach in high school are the tragedies. Yeah, I didn't um, get read, I didn't get to read oh, a Shakespearean comedy until I was in college. Oh no, so we. I think it depends uh, on where you are, though. I did. Yeah. We did read. In my case, um, that would have been Kentucky in the eighties. Right. Yeah, we did read in um, in my high school. We did read um, Merchant of Venice, 
Mm-hmm. Well, there's Which, a happy one. Not not really comic. <laughs> well, basically, <laughs> technically it is. <laughs> it, technically, it is. because nobody dies at the end. That was the way my English teacher explained to it. Because there's a marriage. You, you have a point, body count at the end. <laughs> you have a point at which um, Shylock has the knife and the consequences have been explained to him. And if he goes ahead and collects his pound of flesh, it's a tragedy. If he puts down the knife, it's a comedy. Despite the fact that it didn't end so happily for, for Shylock. But, um, that, you know, so we read that. We read Julius Caesar, which is more of a history than it is a tragedy, even though there's some death. Caesar doesn't yeah. make it to the fifth <laughs> act, you know. Yeah. Um, we but, we read uh, Midsummer. Uh, People, you know. <laughs> well, uh, so do you think that part of what we see here is, and I'll, I'll use an example here since we're talking about books used in school that are also now on the banned books list Lord of the Flies, mm-hmm. Death and Mayhem are perfectly fine and acceptable it's the idea of of love sex and and joy that seems to be the things that get prohibited frequently so you know it is it it, well and i would argue that it is reflective of where do we sit as a society i mean that you know what are the things that we teach kids are acceptable versus the things that are not and you know in terms of we look at things that one age gets taught another age it's banned or you know, even within regions, school districts, who picks what's on a reading list? So as we look at some of these ideas, you know, what do you think are the most common reasons that a book gets quote unquote unquote banned? Is it for the sex? Is it for, or even just the allusion to it? Is it happiness versus misery? You know, what are the things that we're banning, and why do you think we go along those lines? So, um, Alan, I see you smiling. So. No, oh, I'm I'm thinking about um, you know we were talking about earlier about uh, we didn't use the term sanitize but sanitizing death or, or sex or whatever I mean and I look back and all uh, all those westerns that I used to watch on television where people get shot but never would 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 never bleed but um, <laughs> you know uh, there's a wonderful little video about uh, the rifleman which was one of my favorite shows it, it betrays my my age here but i loved the rifleman and uh how many people he killed per show and it, you know it averages out to something like three to four people um and yet you know he was a moral exemplar because he was a great father and so on so uh i think that it you know it changes with it does change with time but i think it changes with uh, certain kinds of constituencies and i don't necessarily want to point to any single group, but I would say that in some sense, the individuals who want to keep a kind of purity in religion and to restrain their children from actually thinking about copulation or how, you know, um, it's not their time to know that or that they don't want, they don't want that addressed or uh, in, in situations like Macbeth, uh, that in fact, um, uh, you know, political intrigue does often lead to uh, murder. And uh, so it's, it's really sort of um, people who have this very narrow, purist idea that in some sense, even in the, in the, in the most, what they would consider puritanical text, you know, that, um, uh, that it doesn't, you know, that, it it it's it won't corrupt the children. I I teach and I recently taught the the Bible as literature, doing the old both the Old Testament and um, and the New Testament or the Hebrew Testament the New Testament. And I'll tell you, um, people are dying left and right and in in very violent ways and often at the hand of God. Um, and so that in some sense uh, we mislead we. You know, we, we should be teaching the Bible a lot more honestly, uh, you know, e- even if we consider that an elevated text. How about you, Don? Um, well, the, the objection I heard the most had to do with language. Um, and so I was very, very fortunate in that uh, most of the I went 
again, I went down the, the most commonly banned books and I taught most of them. Um, the one that I got the most pushback um, was Huck Finn. Mm -hmm. And no matter how many times I tried to explain the use of language and that you know, this was part of the discourse and how, you know, language changed, it, it, I, the principal would finally just say, don't. Um, and I, as much as I love Huck, that wasn't a hill I was willing to die on. Um, but there are other books that, that I really did fight for, like the things they carried, um, violence and language, were um, a lot of objection about that. Um, what was the other? Um, I had to fight really hard for Watchmen um, because of nudity, actually. I was like, I have to send home a permission slip because there's a giant naked blue guy? Okay. <laughs> um, but, I, but I did it. Um, but it, usually it's language to kill a mockingbird language, color purple language, beloved. You know, the, these are the at least. As Samantha At said, least the official the, reasons. That's the official reason, right? They're, they're, they were the hidden ones. Um, typically, though, that was, you know, the, the wall I ran into um, was about language because the kids don't use it or something. I, I'm not really sure. Um, but that's what they point to. The other one that, and it may have to do, um, um, I'm in a sort of rural area and Harry Potter, um, was one but magic I'm like really okay but the line the witch in the wardrobe is okay okay you know and so those were really the two things that that i've encountered and i just very quickly just say something about watchmen because uh it comes up both when i teach the bible's literature and also when i've taught watchmen and you know the the funny thing is that this big it's not very graphically displayed but oh. you know, <laughs> he's, he's totally naked and uh the interesting thing is you know when i'm talking about um uh in genesis you know of course adam and eve uh are uh, condemned because they discover that they're naked and so they cover themselves up and uh the thing is that the image of the god that condemns them for being clothed is a god who's always wearing robes um and you know the question is why isn't God naked? Why does God cover himself up? Um, you know, these are, these are kinds of questions that uh, would irritate a lot of people, but they're really to the point. And, 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 uh, it, and actually, Watchmen was one of, one of the uh, works that really brought that out. Yeah, but yes. There, there are plenty of reasons that people could object to Watchmen, but they hadn't read it. You know, challenging authority and all of kinds of things. It was just the naked blue guy. Mm. That one I fought for, though. I got that one. Then. Um, I found it interesting. Now, um, I don't know if anybody besides me reads comic books on a regular basis, but um, a couple years ago, there was um, what they call was was a Batman. Oh, it was called. I think it was Batman Damned. Oh, and the first the first issue, the first printing of the first issue had Batman taking off his, his his suit, standing there naked, and there was the shadow, let's just say the shadow of the bat pole. <laughs> and oh my God, you thought you thought the Batman had sexually assaulted Robin or something like that. That's how the result Batman is naked. At the same in the same week, there was a watchman spin-off which I forget the title of and, uh, but captain or Dr. Manhattan was also shown naked a lot more graphically and nobody said anything, you know? So, I mean, a lot of it is, I think who is naked, yeah. you know, Batman can't be naked just like in, Man of Steel, Superman can't kill. You know, it's our perception. You know, are we, it's not only what, what, what it's not all, it's more who is naked or, you know, comic books are for kids. So there should be nudity in comic books. You know, that's, you know, um, you know, um, just like I grew up in the 50s and 60s and all that where, 
Um, Paladin was essentially a hired killer and he would kill at least one person, except for the Christmas episode. He would kill at least one person every week. You know, we'd see cowboys shooting other cowboys. We'd see cowboys shooting Native Americans. Um, but uh, they couldn't they couldn't show a woman in a bra. You know, um, yeah, boobs are well, way more shocking than death. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Well, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't just boobs. It was a woman in a bra because of what that signified. You could show her in a bikini, but not a bra because of what that <laughs> suggested. You know, really? so I think as a, as an America in America, right. we are less inclined to um, suppress violence and more inclined to suppress sex. Yeah, I so think it's very very contextual. Um, you know, when I, I was in England, they they were. Um, teenage mutant hero turtles because they couldn't use the word ninja. And mm. so, and this was early in the nineties. So again, it depends on where you are. Okay. Now, um, speaking of American, there was a um, TV mini, there was a TV movie of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde starring Jack Palance. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was controversial because of one scene where Mr. Hyde breaks into this woman's bedroom. She's at her dressing table wearing something skimpy. And she looks up and she sees him approaching her in the mirror. So you get to watch both the woman in the skimpy attire and the monster coming after her. There were attempts in both England and America to censor or completely eliminate the scene. In America, it was because of the skimpy attire. In England, it was because of the violence. Hmm. You know, so that kind of says something about both societies. So the most recent attacks at my school, we just we just went through about um, about of uh, a group of parents trying to get books taken out of our libraries. And that's another thing, too, is like there's when you're talking about school censorship, there's like we don't want this book taught in the classroom, which is kind of a curriculum discussion. And there's also like, we don't even want this book on a shelf where a kid might get it. And so the most recent push in my district was to try to get some books taken out of the library. And I'm happy to say that that parent group failed. What they were after was anything with a positive portrayal of LGBTQ that like, and uh, their argument was like, kids shouldn't be exposed to um, that kind of kissing. And, you know, it was pretty easy to show that we had plenty of young adult novels in our library where people were kissing and right. they were fine with it as long as the people were one male and one female, as opposed to two females or two males. And we're like, I think you guys need to move into this century. And my mm -hmm. school district has a pretty progressive, vicious statement about equity and about um, different kinds of fairness. So... You know, they lost that fight, and I'm happy yeah. they did. And again, but that was I the think, issue. Yeah. Again, I think it goes back to uh, to the fear thing. People people try to ban things of which they are afraid. Yeah, I think so, some people come into this particular one thinking somehow that if you read about the concept of being gay, that you will become gay. Um, like you know. Like there's never been somebody who had those kinds of feelings, never have been exposed to any literature. You know, it's, it's not an attitude I, I can understand myself, but it, it sure, it definitely does look like a kind of fear. And I'm always like, how, how strong are your beliefs if they can't hold up to the slightest little scrutiny or comparison to other beliefs? Yeah. But one thing um, I, I, I be, I'm interested in is, Let's just say you have a school library um, where you've got, say, a combined middle school, high school, and they share one library. There might be some things in the library that are perfectly appropriate for high schoolers, but which are not quite appropriate for middle schoolers. You know, either so the libraries I've seen that are like that have kind of like a section. And right. You know, and if you're not in high school yet, then you had to have a letter from home saying you were allowed to check those out. 
you know, that's, that's, that's one of the great, that's one of the balancing acts is how do you, um, how do I don't want to use the word protect, but how do you make sure what the, what the student is removing from the library, even reading at the library is, um, is a, is, shall we say age appropriate? Yeah. Developmentally appropriate. Right. You don't want, you don't want a, <laughs> an eighth grader reading Fanny Hill. I'd be impressed. The eighth grader it. might want to read it, but you know, <laughs> should should the eighth and you it's know, right. that's something that the school has to decide. I you, think. you said you were in the library reading stuff that you wouldn't bring home. I mean, I don't right. know. Right. Well, somebody, you know. Um no, well, this was this kid. was this wasn't a school library, this was the Enoch Pratt library. So right. but you know, I'm not certain uh, um uh you know if somebody if some kid wants to read above their level. Not necessarily in an appropriate, inappropriate level. I mean, above their level of, let's say, uh, fourth grade, fifth grade competency, and uh, they take out a book by Cormac McCarthy, uh, who is uh, very violent. Um, you know, more power to them. I, I mean, I, I, I don't like Cormac McCarthy because of the violence, but it's not because not. I don't want to restrict them. Uh, to reading that, you know, and I don't necessarily think that they are, it's the same old argument uh, with games like Call of Duty or so on that are are going to turn um, children into violent or, you know, uh, Grand Theft mm -hmm. Auto into street street gang members. Um, you know, it's like the failure of the Hayes Commission, because we were talking a little bit about that in movies, um, and or the failure of Wertheim uh, to right. block uh, you know, is there, you know, um, is there a homoerotic relationship between Batman and Robin? Maybe, uh, you know, let your imagination run with that. And that, you know, one of the things is we have a lot, you know, not kids, nest, but some kids writing fanzines. One of the problems, I think, and this is so difficult to deal with, is uh, addressing, um, you know, getting adult the cemented minds of adult readers, you know, who are trying to impose these bans or trying to remove books like from Samantha's libraries and sort of say, this shouldn't be in here to sort of say, okay, sit down with me. Let's read this together and let's talk about it. Um, you know, uh, and, and some people will willfully ignore the fact that they have LBGTQ friends or gay, you know, any, any kind of situation in their lives or that, um, there's violence being fed to us daily, um, and, and we need to understand we, that. We well, can one thing, one thing I've done, I guess I go to conventions and I sell my books, and sometimes what um, a parent will come up to me and say, do you have anything my son can read? And I just kind of go, here, you know, she says, well, he's 14, what do you think would be appropriate for him? And I generally say, well, what does he watch on television? Because, mm -hmm. you know, if they go, oh, television. Oh, God, I don't let him watch television. Well, then I figure, well, maybe you should just move along. But if she says, oh, well, he watches uh, Game of Thrones and he watches... Um, <laughs> I'm not uh, sure walking dead, <laughs> you know, then, well, lady, anything on the table, you know, type of thing, you know, um, but, um, you know, so, and I think the, the idea of banning books in the, in this day and age where people can, where kids can go online and watch just about and see just about every, you see a lot more than you're trying to ban. Or you can read it. I mean, if any, if a child knows how to use a computer, he knows how to find the interesting books. You well, know, and be thankful he's looking at the interesting books rather than the interesting movies. What you need to say to the son, you know, to the mother is, uh, let me talk to the son and see what he wants to read, or the daughter and see what she reads. And wants well, to sometimes the mother, the mother's right. by right. herself and she's not. She, you know, the boy, the boy's not there. That's the first level of intervention. The, fir the first thing I'm grateful for is they're reading yeah, um, and, and willing to go with those ideas. Uh, the last thing I kind of want to touch on and, and just sort of throw out there, 
in the age of technology we're sitting in, and we're talking about the ability to go online, see about anything, find about anything. You know, we know that there's fan fiction out there that crosses pretty much any and every line that you can imagine. As we also watch some of the things that we're seeing happen societally uh, and some of the movements that are happening, are you worried that we're going to see much stronger movements towards banning things that are much more commercial? I mean, mouse has been a big deal. We saw a lot of school districts going after, you know, things that were blockbuster films, for example, Harry Potter, um, some of the um, hunger game series. We've seen a lot of things that were very, are very popular. I mean, even when Dr. Seuss has been at times declared a banned book Um, in the age of technology and especially eBooks, you know, much like Samantha was saying, the ability to go to the bookstore, if somebody can get a copy, it's going to make its way around. In an age of eBooks, if somebody decides something's not appropriate, or do we even see maybe some of these corporate entities and Amazon, somebody like this going and saying, yeah, we'll put it out there. It'll make it available if you know how to get to it, you know how to find it. But we even see shadow suppression of a lot of print material these days and, and ebook type material. Is this something you're worried about? And is this something you think is going to become more pervasive or less as things go along? Anybody want to take that one? Um, I'll, I'll start it off. Um, I have seen certain books come out or, you know, you know, and uh, generally it's from um, either an, an extreme right wing view or an extreme left wing view. And it's sort of like Amazon announces, well, we don't want to carry this. Now, Amazon is um, whatever you think of it. It is a business. It is a private business. It's not a government business. And they have a perfect right not to carry it. But when Amazon decides they're not going to carry it, um, most people aren't going to be able to get it unless you go to your bookstore and order it specifically. Um, so, yeah, that you could see that happening mostly, I think, on the extreme end, ends of the spectrum, either far left or far right, um, you know, commercial, I just call it commercial where the book isn't banned in that you are forbidden to buy it. You're just, you're the, the markets in which you are buying it uh, are basically limited to the author's website or to the publisher's website. Um, we've already seen where a couple of Dr. Seuss books, since that was brought up, have, have been placed out of print because of certain, con- because of content. Um, I know what the content is and I can't disagree with the decision. But that's that was the publisher's decision to take these out. They're not banning the books and that they're going to come to your house and, you know, take them away. Nobody's taking the copy you already have. Nobody's taking the copy. But the copy may be removed from the library. So, yeah, that that could that could happen. So but I think in general, um, I think we're going to we have more freedom to read what we want to read and the books are more available. But I think there is a danger, if not now, but, you know, the possibility that certain books can be commercially suppressed if people if 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 enough of people don't want want you to read them. I I think I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. That's fine. (laughs) Okay. no, I'll just uh, I'll I'll, you know, uh, um, I think it's going to happen much more as more, you know, uh, fringe groups come about and, uh, <clears throat> you know, and I want to make, uh, I mean, we haven't talked about hate literature, uh, which is a different kind of issue, but it's important in terms of some of those books. And anyway, and, but I also just want to make the argument that uh, social sensitivity is, uh, you know, becoming, you know, which is called snowflakey, uh, is um, different than political censorship. Um, so, you know, getting back to Dr. Seuss, uh, we have a Seussathon here every year, and I used to read um, <clears throat> uh, If I Ran the Zoo, uh, which I objected to because I was trained as a zoologist. So I'm not crazy about zoos, but also because there are some very inappropriate things said about uh, indigenous groups 
you know, who have these animals. And so I would actually police myself when I, when I'd read it out loud. Um, and in some sense, just felt it was appropriate. I, you know, I'll say, okay, I don't want to read that anymore, but it doesn't mean I don't want anybody else to read that anymore. And the same thing is true with, uh, um, um, we, you know, we're, we want to be a more alert, more attentive. I'm not going to use the word woke because anything that you say now that is uh, in some sense about sensitivity or awareness uh, is almost immediately condemned by the right. But uh, I was just reading an article, uh, which many people have heard, that the, uh, the spongy moth, uh, is anybody familiar with the spongy moth? Formerly named the gypsy moth. Mm -hmm. uh, they've changed the name um, because, uh, in, you know, because in, in many ways it's offensive to Roma. And so you have all of these zoologists and taxonomists who are in a world completely different than the literary world that we're talking about, but who are alert and sensitive to certain kinds of issues and are making changes. They're not banning necessarily, uh, but they are revamping. Um, and so well, they have names of sports teams that have been changed. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, uh, Sonoma State Cossacks uh, are now uh, re have been renamed because they were on the Russian rivers. So they were called Cossacks, notwithstanding all, you know. Um, I know that there were Cossacks and I know that they probably killed many of my relatives. Um, I'm just as happy to see the name change, but uh, I certainly wouldn't enforce a ban. I think... Along the same vein, um, as I sort of said at the beginning, I write erotic romance. And so um, this, I don't know how much time you've spent in Romance Landia, um, but there are some serious turf wars that, that happen um, over things that are appropriate and, and appropriate and not appropriate. Um, and so I think this is concern, the idea of being banned or shadow banned um, is, um, among my my friends who also write erotic romance, I mean, there are people kink shaming and all of this other thing that that happen. And um, just because it's not your thing doesn't mean it's not somebody else's. But people don't want to admit to it. And and so yeah, it, it is it is a fear. And and not so much I think um, things are going to get banned, but I think things aren't going to get published. Um, so unless you go indie publish or, you know, something along those lines that there are lots of potentially really good things that aren't going to see the light of day. So, you know, that, that really is, that is a fear um, that I think is sort of that simmers under the surface, especially since romance as a genre in general is, is sort of shamed. You know, there, there's all kinds of turf words. We can't even be in the New York times bestseller list. Um, so I think that, that, Less about being banned, more about never seeing the light of day. What the New York Times bestseller list won't accept romance writing, romance fiction. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Nope, can't be on it if it's if it's pure romance. How about you, Samantha? Anything on your? I'm any sorry, thoughts? I'm just amazed. Sorry, anything on? Any thoughts? Uh, I had a bunch of them, but they've all wandered in and out. I'm up past my bedtime. <laughs> Um, but I, uh, I, th I, distribution is, is a serious concern that like, you know, if your work is not going to be available on Amazon, it's much harder to get it out there to people. That's true. But it's also true that, you know, there's so many ways to get work out there these days. So, um, I feel like the danger of, um, having your work banned in this large sense where it's hard to get is maybe not so big a concern. Now, if, you know, maybe you won't become the next J.K. Rowling and make tons of money off of your book because it's not being distributed widely, but being just banned altogether, that's pretty unlikely. And, you know, the thing that always gets me about people wanting to ban books is I'm like, you know, you can choose what you want to read. I don't know why you need to think that other people can't choose what they want to read. And, you know, and in the schools, okay, if you want to say your child can't read this, that is your right as their parent, but you are not the parent of my child or these other people's children over here. So what business is that of yours? And I think that's, that's a, that's a line that's clear to me is like, 
it's okay for me to make decisions about my boundaries and the boundaries for my own children, but not about your, you, you guys, I can't tell you that you can't read something or that your children can't read something. That's not my business. And that's a, a line for me that just isn't there for people who would go with banning books as a, the hill they're going to die on. <laughs> um, one last thing, as I was preparing for this and I was looking at the list of, of banned books and looking at the banned books that I've read and all that, I found the irony in that one of the banned books is Fahrenheit 451. Right. Oh, yes, of course. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hey, I, I think this was called favorite band books. You didn't ask me what my favorite band book was. What do you think my last question is going to be? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I think this is a good place to go and wrap up. So as we go around, let everybody know where to find you, website, social media, all that kind of good stuff. And tell people, what is that favorite band book of yours that everybody needs to add on that to be read pile? Um, so we'll work backwards. Uh, Alan, how about you? Well, okay. I'm, uh, I'm not really readily available on social media, but I'm in uh, most of the venues, Twitter and so on. Uh, kind of quiet there. But I'm at UNC Charlotte and teach there and in the English department. Um, I'll just say very quickly about, I mean, I have uh, been really absorbed by uh, all the controversy surrounding Mouse. I didn't read Mouse originally, be paradoxically, because I grew up in a home where my my parents were constantly trying to get me to read books about the Holocaust. And uh, I grew up, I had relatives who died, and very close relatives who died in the Holocaust. And like I said, oh God, not, a, not another book, not another book, you know. And so I tried to resist them. I, I didn't even read Anne Frank's diary until I actually went to Amsterdam and uh, I was coming down and I said, well, I better get this book, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm making this too long. But what I'll say is that it turns out, I think that Mouse was the very thing that captured me because, uh, you know, I'm much younger than Spiegelman, but not by much, uh, not as like the rest of you. Um, but one of the things I did to avoid reading about the Holocaust was to read comic books. And of course, Superman is all about the Holocaust anyway. Um, but uh, so I read cartoons and then somebody said, well, you know, you need to read Mouse. And I read it, you know, because it's the medium that avoids the topic until the topic actually takes over from the medium. And uh, it was a phenomenal. I mean, I read it when I was in my 30s and uh, that turned me around. Um, I've never taught a course in a graphic novel without teaching mouse. And I recognize, and I, you know, I regret to say in Tennessee, uh, you know, the false cover, and I can't remember if it was Samantha or Dawn who said something to that effect, the false cover of talking about uh, uh, dirty words or a naked picture uh, for what is really intrinsically um, a kind of semitophobism. So, John, how about you? Hey, um, again, I'm John L. French. Um, I've got a book coming out in um, probably in the next several months. Um, it's the third and last book in my uh, Bianca Jones series called The Last Monster, um, in which I wrap up uh, Bianca Jones's story. And um, well, I don't want to give too much away, <laughs> but uh, it is it is a story of let's just say it's a story of redemption. And, um, but, um, you can find me on, um, Facebook, uh, you can email me jfrenchfam at, at AOL.com, or you could follow me or just now you can follow me on book. Club. And as far as my favorite band book, um, I think I've mentioned it. It was Fahrenheit 451, which is the ultimate novel about band books. How about you, Samantha? So I'm Samantha Bryant. I write the Menopausal Superhero series and of, a, of novels, and I write a variety of short fiction, um, horror, science fiction, fantasy, whatever catches me today. 
Um, you can find me at samanthabryant.com. And on most social media, I'm Samantha B. Writer, just the letter B in the middle for Bryant. Um, and my favorite band book, I think, you know, you know, it's one of those things, favorite book at all is, you know, you get a different answer depending on what day you ask me. But the one that came to mind um, when you asked the question was Beloved by um, Toni Morrison. And really, I recommend reading just like everything that woman wrote. It's amazing and well worth your time and will expand your thinking in a lot of good ways. Dawn? Um, I'm Dawn Deal. The last name is spelled D-E-H-E-L. Um, I write under D-S Deal. And the easiest way to find links to all my social media is at dsdeal.com. I'm like Samantha asking my favorite band book. Wow, like this is really hard. I think we're going to swap here. Um, probably Speak by Laurie Hall Sanderson. Um, it's such a good book. And it, it's one that I, I enjoy teaching. And just about anything by her is fantastic as, as well. So, you know, that highly recommend. Go read it. And if I may add, um, oh, if you're interested, if you're, I mean, I would recommend that, um, you go to you go um, do a search for banned books. Look at the list, and if there's one that you haven't read, look it up and see if you should be reading it. Well, and I've had the pleasure of being your host tonight, Jim Nettles. You can find me at jamespnettles.com, authoressentials.net, authoressentialsworkshops.com, uh, the Speculative Fiction Academy, and of course here at Continual. And because I'm going last, I can do anything I want to. But <laughs> the one title I'm going to put out there, because I think it is a little appropriate to the world we're in these days, and I notice that it's always on that band book list, is Catch-22. Okay. And somehow that feels really appropriate these days. And so, so <laughs> Slaughterhouse-Five is another one. And Slaughterhouse-Five <laughs> was going to be my other title. <laughs> <laughs> So thanks everybody for hanging out this evening and we will see you again soon.